What an incredible day so far, isn't it? Uh, uh, I'm really grateful to be here with you in Boston. So good afternoon to everyone here at Harvard Club. Uh, good afternoon to people following us online, especially people from the south of Brazil. Uh, you are in your thoughts and our praise, so be strong. Uh, we are here today in this panel to talk about AI revolution. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not talking about AI revolution again, not, not after lunch. Uh, but we, we, we are going through a, a massive revolution, and it's not a, a simple one. Uh, we all have been listening things like, the world will never be the same again, and that's true. The revolution we are going through right now is uh, different of every other we had before. Uh, it's not a technical revolution. It's, I'm not trying to say that technology revolution is simple. They, they aren't. But it's much broader revolution. Uh, Social-wise, education-wise, political-wise, why not? And if there is one thing that we have learned from our revolution we have gone through so far, it is that they generate side effects. Side effects, these consequences, will play a decisive role on our future and the future of upcoming generation. So we are here today to speak a little bit about this side effect, and I have here with me five great minds that are going to share a little bit their experience about that and what they are doing. So I will start asking you guys to introduce yourselves and your background and your companies, and then after, we're going to talk a little bit about your use case. So please, please, if you want to start. Yes, uh, so I'm Luis Gondim. Uh, I've been working in technology for many years now, uh, although uh, my picture here seems that I'm a little bit younger than I actually is. Um, I worked like uh, many years at uh, a Beanbev that uh, is one of the largest uh, CPGs in the world, and, and now I work at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, now I heard that uh, people were talking about curing the cancer and so on, so I, I think that uh, Pretty much we're going this direction, so I love it to, to hear these comments because it's something that I can mention later. But uh, very glad to be here, uh, talk a little bit about the organization, what we are doing, and how we can really speed things up also in the, in the health care industry because I think it's something that all of us want to live better than, than we are living sometimes, as was mentioned before here in these panels as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Sashenka, could you go next? You have a mic there. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> That's a cool picture. I did not share it, but thanks for finding that picture on LinkedIn, I guess. Uh, I'm Shashank. I work for a company called uh, Fanatics. We are the, uh, the biggest um, e-com retail partner for all the major sports in the United States. We also partner with international uh, sports like PSG, um, uh, and uh, many other uh, leagues. We are not only selling t-shirts and jerseys, but we are connecting passionate fans, 100 million of them, all around the world with their favorite teams and athletes very, very deeply. So we use technology, machine learning, and now AI uh, for making these digital experiences better for our customers um, every day. Awesome. Andre, please introduce yourself. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Andre Nascimento. I'm from Brazil, a uh, friend of Gustavo, uh, knows him uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, I am the Andre. The guy in the picture is another one. I don't know who he is. <laughs> you guys can see for the beard, right? Um, so, uh, I built my career around uh, technology and uh, software development. So I started as a programmer, then uh, engineer, uh, architect, uh, then uh, I started to uh, work more as, uh, as an executive in service companies, uh, mainly in Brazil and in Latin America region. 
Uh, then I, have, uh, I had a very good experience uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, created my own company, built a lot of code, um, made a lot of uh, coffees <laughs> to clients and things like that. Um, you know, played uh, every role in the company. Um, then I, I moved my career to the consulting, com to the consulting industry. So we spent uh, eight years at McKinsey Company. Uh, was one of the co-founders of Digital McKinsey in Latin America, where I dedicated a, a, a lot of my time to serving uh, huge clients uh, in companies around uh, Latin America in topics related to transformation, digital, uh, new business creation, and things like that. And uh, after I um, decided to move from the consulting firm, I joined the, to the consulting industry. I joined BNP Paribas Cardiff uh, in, in Latin America as the chief operating officer in Latin America. So I'm pretty much responsible for technology and operations for, for five countries in, in Latin America. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much my, my, my history. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. So, uh, Felipe, can, can you go next? Hi, hi guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, Felipe, I'm from Banco Mercantil. Banco Mercantil is a mid-sized bank. Uh, we are 81 years old, family-owned, but listed in Brazil. Bank has pivoted its business from corporate to mass retail market in the last five years. Uh, I joined the bank to be one of the guys helping this transformation. Uh, I've done pretty much everything there is to be done in IT, from data centers to cable to developer. And then I pivot my career to business, what I've been doing for the last five years. And something I'm very passionate about is conversational commerce. What are my cases, the cases I'm going to talk about to you, with you today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Felipe. So, a song, please. Yes. Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yesterday was my birthday. I'm the one who... Uh... Oh, man. <laughs> So, so thank you very much. You, everybody made me feel uh, very welcome yesterday. Um, so I'm a managing director at uh, Sun Technologies. Um, uh, Sun is a global technology and services company, uh, really focused on uh, helping you know, companies and governments around the world unlock value from, uh, from AI. Uh, later on, I can talk a little bit about some of the work that we do. Uh, but specifically at Sun, I'm... I'm responsible for our customer solutions. And what that means is I work uh, with a lot of, of potential customers to really understand at a deep level what are some of the problems that they're trying to solve and make sure that we bring the best of our organization uh, to unlock value for them. Uh, prior to joining Sun, I worked at a company called C3 AI, where it's based in Silicon Valley, they also do enterprise AI. Uh, I led the customer solutions organization in the energy vertical. Uh, and then I, I spent a few years at McKinsey as well, much like you, um, doing consulting in strategy, but also in kind of digital and analytics. And a little bit earlier in my career, I started out in engineering working uh, in the oil and gas industry. So I spent about 13 years uh, in the upstream oil and gas space, uh, doing all kinds of work from engineering all the way out to the rigs um, and in account manage as, uh, management as well. So really looking forward to, uh, to the conversation here today. So. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Asong. Thank you for the introduction, everybody. So let's start uh, understanding a little bit about your, what you have been doing inside your companies around AI, but also uh, how are you handling uh, the consequence of your actions of what you're doing uh, when it comes to the security and the responsibility, responsibility part. So uh, Luis, can we start sharing with us what Johnson uh, it, it, is doing right now about this? Sure. Uh, I would like to connect a few dots that were mentioned before here. I think about uh, the, on, on the innovation side, uh, I think we're trying to do a lot of things faster. Uh, and if there is a failure that uh, it's fast as well and cheap, we try to do things faster and not spend a lot of time and money on that. Uh, and we have nowadays more than 200 use cases mapped uh, using AI for several things, from R&D to commercial applications. Uh, I think when we think about security and things that we're trying to incorporate, there is a, a lot of regulation in pharmaceutical industries, uh, as you guys might know, 
uh, a lot of time for you to develop a new drug. So we try to make sure that uh, what uh, we see AI doing right now for us is that in the first phase of the discovery uh, with AI, and even if we put things together, AI and quantum computing, for example, uh, we can process a lot of multiple combinations of molecules that uh, before used to take a lot of years. So we believe that uh, this is going to very soon is going to be a breakthrough for, for the industry because we can de decrease the time of uh, drug discovery. So this is uh, super important and, and big. And the focus for us is oncology and immunology. So things that are very important for everybody here. I'm pretty sure that everybody here at least know one uh, person that has a heart disease or had a cancer. So that's pretty much what we're, we're trying to uncover. And then going forward to commercial applications, for example, there is a lot of things that when we talk about training, uh, compliance and so on, there is a lot of misinformation, right? So I'm pretty sure that everybody here as well has an experience with fake news or whatever information that you don't know if it's true or not because you cannot check the facts. So an application that we're trying to do right now, we are trying to bring to, do, to our reps like the source of the study. So when they're talking to the physicians, it's easy for them to say, okay, we are telling you that, why? Because of this, this and that, check the facts. And things that uh, they couldn't uh, say before uh, because they had to research and so on. So right now we have an application that we develop and it's at scale right now in Latin. I take care of Latin, so like uh, for us it's Central America and, and, and South America, so for Mexico and below. Uh, in all the countries, what we have is an application that the reps, they can go to the physicians and they can, they can like uh, in natural language, they can interpret whatever the, the physician is asking and in three seconds you have an answer with like all the studies and you have the facts, not only the opinion. So uh, we are pretty much going this direction of making sure that we do things right. We are doing things in compliance with the regulation. Uh, just to finish, I think one thing that we, as a group, as we were talking about a lot, uh, we want to put process in place most of the times, but there is a lot of process that sometimes kills creativity. So how can we make sure that we have the right process instead of creating bureaucracy, but we have the process to make things right? So that's pretty much what we're doing there. Yeah. Great. Uh, talking a little, uh, still with you, Luis, uh, talking a little uh, about the bureaucracy you, you just... Uh, Spoke. So uh, you are in a regulated environment, you, 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 the pharmaceutical industry. So and uh, this uh, regulated environment, uh, they often make things slower but safer uh, on the other side. So is it a challenge for you to thrive the innovation in such a uh, regulated environment and in, in, inside your company? I think for the company, yes. Uh, I, I'm not in R&D, so I see my, my colleagues like uh, having a lot of challenges. And, and, and imagine that uh, when you talk about countries, each country has their own regula uh, regulation. So when you think about Latin, there is more than 20 countries in Latin only. So imagine that uh, when we approve something for Brazil, doesn't mean that we can apply to Mexico. And if I apply in Colombia, it doesn't mean that I can apply in Uruguay, for example. So there is a lot of things that you need to talk to, to the regulators in each one of the countries. So that's something definitely that is not even related to technology. It's just related to a conversation, bureaucracy, people that will be in the place trying to make sure that they break these barriers for us to go. Uh, and, and I believe that uh, one of the things that, we, again, with the usage of AI that we can accelerate is to bring source of the things that we're talking about. Uh, one thing that we're discussing, and I've been discussing with a couple of friends for, for, for a long time, uh, we are always, and someone men mentioned here uh, today, garbage in, garbage out, right? So I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we are having access to is the right data, the data that uh, then we can build the models and then we can try to help like at breaking these barriers for then we don't create bureaucracy, but we create simplified process. One of the things that we're trying to do as well is like a prioritizing a lot, simplification in all the process that we have. So again, just coming back from a pandemic that we had like a couple of years back, we could break a lot of barriers that uh, somehow we are trying to build it again. Instead of like, just, okay, forgot about this, we already did, now we are creating again. So uh, forget about digital, let's go face to face again. So for, uh, what if everything happened again, right? So let's make sure that we have both. So we have face to face, we have digital, we have the facts, we have the right models. So that's how we are trying to accelerate to make sure that uh, 
we overcome the, the bureaucracy that you're talking about. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Sashanka, what about you? What fanatics are doing uh, in an AI environment and how the things are going? So clearly, we are not solving cancer. We are selling T-shirts. <laughs> That's all we're doing. Uh, um, so definitely different. How, how's the retail industry? So? <laughs> That's right. So it's a different problem. But um, sports fans are extremely passionate. You want to make sure you're giving them the right information immediately after the game. Tom Brady has this amazing touchdown. All his fans are happy. They want to actually buy that champion's hat that he's wearing. How fast can we actually get that out to the customer is primarily um, what we want to do because that moment is really important for their memories. People, uh, I remember uh, Chicago Cubs actually won in 2016. They've been waiting for 100 years um, to uh, win that. Uh, there were fans who bought uh, baseballs and took them to their dad's uh, grave because their dad passed away before uh, the Cubs won. It's a very passionate sport. So you want to be very, very careful when uh, giving this information about uh, uh, their teams. So when you're generating this content about product descriptions and such, we should be very careful um, to make sure that we do not say anything bad about the opposing team. If you look at any sports articles out there, they usually are talking about that team, but also badmouth the opposing team. So we cannot actually train on those articles to generate these descriptions. So one of the challenges. We have been invested in machine learning for a long time in terms of uh, dynamic pricing, in terms of providing better uh, personalized uh, search results, better core search functionalities, and such. The usual e-com uh, stuff we have been doing for a lot of, uh, for a long time. OK, great. Thank you. So now with you, Andre. As, as a CEO, you are in charge of make the process uh, more efficient, but you also act as a guardian of this process. So how this topic is handled in the in insurance industry in your company? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, and I, I always believed that uh, there is a kind of a false dichotomy uh, between dynamic and velocity, and in the other hand, uh, uh, instability, right, and insecurity. I think that uh, w w one thing enables the other. So when we think about a solution that uh, you want to be sustainable and to create real, real, real impact in the business, uh, we need to uh, also, uh, almost uh, always to address these two points. So how to be dynamic, how to be fast, but at, at the end of the day, uh, being at the same time uh, uh, stable and, uh, and secure, right? So, and I think that um, within, within new technologies, we have seen this in the past. Of course, uh, now with uh, um, AI and uh, analytics, we are seeing this uh, much faster than we have seen you know, with other technologies in the past. Uh, we have the same, uh, you know, false dilemma. In uh, I, my work, uh, my, my job is to understand the, the, what are the key uh, necessities from the business, and not only in Latin America, but in EMEA as well, and uh, in Asia, uh, you know, heavy regulated as well, within uh, local rules, and uh, in some uh, cases, completely different rules, uh, especially in Latin America, because you guys know Latin America, so it's not so easy to, to, to understand all the regulation aspects there. But we need to be always, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, um, uh, innovating and, and following those, uh, those regulations. Um, so I, I would say that my job is to bring this balance between what the business wants to do, what the business needs to do, uh, be, being very close to the business. I, I remember that some of our colleagues were saying uh, uh, earlier today uh, that, that uh, one of the key uh, thing, things for the technical people like us uh, that are gathering here is to understand that uh, we are not uh, another part of the company, right? Uh, ACP, ACP, and Danilo were saying that. Uh, we are not a part of the, the company, we are part of the business, right? So you are not a different part or, 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 or a segregated uh, part of the company. So we need to think business. Uh, and at the same time, we need to help business to think 
on technology, on the on the security aspect of the technology and the in all the, the the stability aspects of the technology. So this is pretty much my 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 daily job, and uh, then I I, I can uh, talk a little bit more about what we are seeing and what we have done within AI and uh, other emerging technologies. Oh, great, thank you, thank you. Now, Felipe, uh, I learned from you yesterday that Banco Mercantil is doing a great job around AI. And you are playing a decisive role about that. So uh, tell us those stories, please. Well, first, sorry for everybody that supports more the concept of AI than applying. I like applying things. For me, get shits done. It's important. It's the way we do in the bank. Uh, Mercantile is a mid-sized retail bank. We split our business between branches that represent 40% of the business and digital channels that represent 60%. And among the digital channels, we have WhatsApp, which accounts for more than half of everything we sell. And the average ticket size for a loan is 75 bucks. Then, you know, it needs to be a mass market. Just last April, we sold over WhatsApp more than 250 million US dollars. Then everything must be automated. And I brought two cases here today to talk about ethics and security. The first one is a customer goes to WhatsApp, and for whatever reason, I know the customer prefers to be deal by a human being than by a bot. However, I don't give a human being to support the customer. I give a bot, and the bot mimics the human behavior. The bot even introduces itself. It says, hi, I'm Beatrice, and I'm here to support you. After the needs of the customer being uh, fulfilled, I ask for an NPS, and I have some score. If the score is high enough, I understand that that customer relies on Beatrice from now on. The next time you go to a bot, everybody would present Beatrice again, but that's not the case, because when you call to a call center, you never get the same agent, you get someone else. And that's what we mimic. We say, well, look, the last time you were here, Beatrice helped you, but Beatrice is not here today, or Beatrice is not available right now, but I'm Joe, and I'm willing to help you. Do you prefer to wait for Beatrice, or can I help you? 90% of the customers, they prefer to go ahead and get helped by Joe. After some time, and it changed from customer to customer, Beatrice comes around and say, hey, I've seen Joe is helping you, but I'm available now. Do you prefer to keep going with Joe, or do you want to change to myself, Beatrice? And that's one way we mimic the behavior. Someone asked me that question, oh, and if the customer asks you if you are a human being or a bot, we just ignore that question. We don't answer. We don't lie to the customer, but we choose what questions we want to answer or not. And that's, on the ethical perspective, it's hard. On efficiency perspective, my conversion rate on WhatsApp is 14%. You can go to any e-commerce in the world. And I learned yesterday, some e-commerce, the good ones, may have six. I have 14. Then ethics can be bad. We can blend or bend the lines in order to get something. The second case is more about security. Although we may see this as an ethical problem at first, it's a security problem. I grant loans. And the biggest reason for defaults is death. Once the, per the person dies, there is no way it's cost efficient to go after the estate. I have to just take the cut and understand that's delinquency, and that's it. Then forecasting death is important for me. I don't do that anymore. I used to do that, and I learned a new way. And nowadays, I forecast the likelihood of the person being alive in the final installment. Let's say the customer wants a loan with a duration of 30 months. I forecast the likelihood of the, cus the customer being around to fulfill that last installment. If the customer can ask for a loan with 30 installments and I grant the loan, and if the customer asks for a loan with 50 installments and I don't grant it, the customer, knowing a bit about my process, can understand that, well, there is some likelihood I'll not be around. Of course, there are other reasons, but there is a security point here. If the customer tries to trick the system, he can understand that I'm forecasting his death. What does that represent to the company on the liability side? 
Although those seem threat, threatening, sorry, the delinquency level at our bank right now is the lowest one in Brazil, with only 2.5%. The biggest bank in Brazil, Itaú, has a delinquency rate of 2.7%, and my total asset size in US dollar is around 10 billion. Itaú is 250 billion. There is a difference in scale that uh, helps to reduce the delinquency rate. But once you look at the accuracy of the model, it's 88% onwards. However, the model is very biased. I cannot reuse that model to anything else. I cannot evolve that model. I have to throw it away and build a new one. Everything we learn, things should be adapted. Things should evolve. Things should grow. I don't do, but I am effective. How does that present a challenge? These are impressive figures. So uh, for the ch chat situation, we could create a new Turing test. So instead of trying to understand if we are talking to a human being or a machine, which avatar we are talking to, Beatrice or the other one? So that's great. We have tried. People usually, they don't want to know. The masses, they don't want to know. Do something that is as simple as the person doesn't have to think to redo again. Once he or she learns something, just reuse that knowledge. Every time you try to create a new process, you have to endure the phase that the customer needs to learn that. Of course, it's needed in order the evolution to be around, but once the basis is there, and that's what we do with WhatsApp, we leverage the conversational part of the thing. We exchange messages, we don't do e-commerce. We do conversational commerce, it's a different thing. Because we using whatever the customer already knows, it's better. And we can try to mimic bots, but the customer likes to be, sorry for saying that, food. They are talking to a human being. Why should I get rid of that expectation? Yeah, yeah. Completely agree with you. So, Asank, what about you? Tell us what you're doing in Sentech about it. Yeah, so maybe just to shed a bit more light on what, uh, what we do at Sun. I think with the emergence of um, you know, OpenAI's chat GPT, it kind of brought AI to the forefront, to the masses, right? And now everybody talks about AI. Um, you know, as Sun as an organization, we've been, you know, uh, we've been five year track journey on executing uh, AI. And this is largely focused around what I'll call traditional AI, uh, not so much chatbots, although we do do some of those as well. And we also have a, a 10 year history in terms of, of, of teaching AI. When I talk about building AI, we've built 63 applications for 50 clients around the world uh, in various industries, you know, from telco to water utilities to healthcare uh, to insurance. Uh, and you can see there, you know, some of the, uh, the clients that we've, we've, we've done work for, uh, solving all kinds of problems, you know, around helping perhaps um, telco companies think about where they should lay fiber or where they should put 5G uh, antennas to how they can optimize uh, their networks to be able to reduce energy. One of the key things that we do at Sun is on the supply side of our business where we do training. Um, so if you look at some stats right now, um, Africa is the youngest continent in the world. The average age of an African is 19 years old. Um, in the next 10 years or so, the biggest workforce in the world is going to be in Africa. And by the turn of the century, about 40% of the world's population is going to be in Africa. And so one of the things that we're doing as an organization is to be able to uh, capitalize on that demographic advantage. And so we have uh, what we think is one of the biggest training academies in the world, um, you know, to basically uh, train uh, a lot of uh, students. So like this year, for example, we're on track to train about 250 uh, thousand technical talent in terms of data scientists, software engineers, and, and all whatnot. And we have a vision to say in the next uh, 10 to 15 years to train about 3 to 5 million technical talent and hire about a million of those within our own organization. Um, uh, all 
Oops. Something is wrong here. Yeah. Ah, there no, you go. Right. Thank so you. I thought what I'll do is to maybe just pick one of the topics that, that uh, one of the areas where we do work to, uh, to talk about quickly. Um, and this is in the utility space, right? And so if you look in the utility space, uh, what are some of the key challenges that CEOs are dealing with on some of the leaders in these companies, right? One of them is around figuring out how do they minimize fines and regulatory compliance. Um, you know, these are things around like making sure that you don't have interruptions toward the coming to clients. The second is around uh, minimizing operating cost. You know, so these are uh, energy costs or looking at, you know, making sure that you prevent things um, uh, like unplanned failures. And then the last piece is, you know, if you have capital, how do you, uh, are you able to like optimize or, or, or use that uh, efficiently? You know, as an organization, we've been able to come up with uh, production gate applications that are running live in, in, in clients to be able to solve a lot of these problems, right? All the way from, if you look at, um, on the clean water side, being able to develop applications that leverage AI to figure out when you might have leaks in the system, all the way to applications that will figure out where you know, a pipe might burst, so, such that you're able to position uh, a, a team nearby to be able to make those changes uh, to reduce the amount of interruptions that they have, uh, all the way to applications that uh, improve, uh, you know, reduce, leverage digital twins to be able to reduce carbon footprints for clients. Um, and to uh, applications that you can leverage to be able to uh, optimize, you know, how you're deploying your capital. So let me maybe just quickly deep dive on uh, one of the ones where you're using to, uh, to, to deploy, you know, kind of capital. The challenge is that, you know, a lot of water companies uh, face is that if you look at their asset base, his historically they've not made a lot of investments, right? You know, and so you end up with a lot of aging infrastructure. Uh, the other thing that you often find is that they're typically dealing with uh, changing and multiple priorities. You know, so there are environmental changes, there are regulatory concerns, and so they need to uh, deal with all of those. And they will often have huge asset base. You know, so if you think about a typical water company, they have pipes, they have valves, they have all kinds of things. And ultimately, the, the key challenge that they end up with is that um, they need to figure out how to prioritize the replacements of these assets, right? Like they don't have enough money to like replace everything. And so what's the best way that uh, they can go about doing uh, something like that, right? And so one of the applications that we've, we've developed, we worked with uh, one of the uh, biggest water utility companies in the UK um, to help them figure out, you know, how do we go about prioritizing the different assets that they need to replace. And so if you think about what it takes to be able to do something like that, you have to first of all identify what are all of the critical data sources that they need, you know, to be able to go through and do that, you know. So it's things around what's the asset base, you know, how are they operating, how old are all of these assets. Uh, and then you then need to be able to ingest all of this data uh, into some sort of platform where you do your analytics on top of it. And in this case, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, there's a few things that you can do when you're doing the analytics. One is to be able to predict, to say, okay, out of all of my assets, which of them are likely to fail, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is to say, okay, if an asset does fail, what's the consequence of failure, right? And so you can imagine if I have a pipe that's taking water to a hospital versus a pipe that's taking water to a local area, the consequence of that failing is completely different for those two. And then ultimately being able to put that together to come up with what we've called an asset health index, which based off of that, they can then prioritize uh, which of the assets that they can replace. And for some of the work that we've done, uh, we've seen that, you know, companies can uh, save anywhere from 1% to 2% in terms of efficiency of how they're deploying capital in terms of deciding which of those assets to replace. And that's additional capital that they can use to then replace more assets, right? If you think about, you know, uh, from what it takes from a, you know, security and responsibility standpoint, for this example that I'm talking about here, water is critical. It's a critical infrastructure, right? Like, we, we can't live without water. And so, you then need to be very careful in terms of who has access to that data, how you're managing that data, 
to make sure that you know the finer uh, products and things that you're offering, uh, you know, certainly would uh, you know create advantage for the company and for society. So yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So great use case. I will keep it to you. Uh, I have a question. The artificial intelligence uh, presents us a number of ways to how to help the world to be more sustainable. On the other hand, uh, AI requires huge amounts of computing power, and since computers they, they need electricity, they will consume it at a colossal rate. So uh, my question is how can we try to balance this equation and mitigate the adverse side effects on the environment? What, what, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think uh, Alexander and, and Troy touched on that earlier where they were talking about the, you know, the level of consumption that a lot of these models are taking. And in fact, I think I've read in, in certain places that, you know, to train some of these models, you can use, you know, amount of energy that, you know, 100 plus US homes, you know, use, right? And uh, there have even been discussions around people were planning to shut down some of like coal-fired power plants where they now need to like keep some of these up just to be able to like meet some of uh, these requirements. So it is a real concern. Um, personally, I believe that, you know, you know, AI can also help us to be able to address some of these problems, right? And I, I think there's a, a few different levels that we can, we can think through. Uh, you can go all the way down to, uh, you know, the GPUs where we're kind of designing these. And I think if you look at companies like NVIDIA, they've put quite a bit out there in terms of how much more efficient some of the new chips that they're bringing out that those are working. Uh, you know, and then another level is to look at the algorithms themselves, right? You know, so Troy was talking to us earlier here on the stage about how much more efficient some of the algorithms that they have coming out um, are much, you know, in terms of how they're operating. Um, and then if you look at, you know, what uh, some of the, uh, the hyperscalers are doing, you know, like Google, for example, has talked about like being able to use DeepMind uh, you know, to save about 40% in terms of like the energy that you use in some of your data centers. Um, and, and if you take a step back, you can then also see how AI is being used uh, much more broadly. You know, kind of in a previous life, you know, I worked in deploying an application called energy management, which looked at uh, being able to uh, make sure that we're using energy more efficiently you know, within buildings, but all the way down to factory level, you know, to able to get sensors and, and optimize, you know, how much those energies are using, you know. So I think, yes, AI is consuming energy, but it, we can also then leverage it to help us, you know, kind of uh, address it as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have much time remaining, so I'll have a final question for each of you. Uh, of all possible concerns, which one worries you the most? For each of, of you, quickly, which one, which concern, where is the most? You can start the song and then you come to Philippe. No, I think the biggest concern for me is that as a society, we get to the point where we become too comfortable with AI, right? Like we stop using it. It's like everybody uses Google Maps and sometimes you get in your car and then you just put your head on auto drive and you don't really think about potentially what are the implications, you know? So. Uh, you know, we come complacent. I think that's my biggest concern. So, yeah. right, Andre. For for me, is that uh, the, this balance between how can we leverage the technology uh, to become better, uh, to become better humans, uh, better professionals, uh, better in what we do, and not only you know uh, um, transfer to AI or to the technology. Uh, part, big parts of uh, what makes us uh, human beings, you know? So uh, I think that this, uh, this point of view or this optical to, to see AI in any other uh, advanced technologies as more as a tool for us as humans and not the opposite is, uh, is really important. And I think that uh, we, 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 we have uh, to play a key role in this uh, um, in this matter uh, across uh, from now to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Sashanka, please. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll try to keep it short as well. Um, I think we have never been more divided as, uh, as a race, as a human race, um, ever. And this is with social media, this is with global travel, global trade, and this is the most divided we have ever been. I am uh, very scared of uh, situations where we are, we are consuming 
information from echo chambers, things that you only like. You are not actually hearing to other, other people. The, the rate of suicides have gone up, loneliness have gone up. There are kids who are actually shutting themselves down in uh, uh, houses not coming out. This is a uh, thing that I recently learned about. I am very worried about us getting so used to talking to an AI. Um, yesterday's demo with uh, OpenAI's fold uh, it was very scary for me. Um, you will come to a place where loneliness could become a huge problem for uh, humankind, so I'm worried about that. There's so many other things I'm worried about, but this one, definitely. Thank you, Thank you Sashank. Please, Luis. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much like this, like uh, we are completely divided, so the technology can be as good as we are, so that's it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to the address point, shallowness. We are using things that sometimes we cannot explain, and we are having results we cannot understand why, and each new generation is getting shallower and shallower and shallower, because it's, everything is so easy nowadays, they don't have to build anything. That's my fear. Thank you. Thank you so much, my fellow panelists. I hope uh, we can continue this conversation in our happy hour. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.